Thank you for auditing Professor Sky's record review, the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor who's going to be talking a lot about the new album Shore by the Fleet Foxes. If you don't like my long videos, you didn't click on this one. If you do, have a seat. I think this is going to be a good video. Uh, now, I like to, whenever possible, weave in my own personal history with a band when I talk about their new music, and the Fleet Foxes are no exception. Uh, when they came out, or when I became aware of them in 2009, I was already a dad twice, right? I had a two-year-old and a four-year-old, and like, I was like, basically already dead to music. You know, I talk a lot on this channel about mid-twenties music death. It's a real thing that happens. You hit about 23, 24, 25, and you just decide all new music is bad, only the old stuff is good. It happens to everybody. It happened to me for a long period of time before I started this channel. But still, a, every once in a while, a band would seep in and the Fleet Foxes seeped into the corners, and I'll explain why in a second. But this led to me going to a Fleet Foxes concert, which is pretty spectacular. I mean, this is like, you know, when you're a new parent, you go to like two movies a year and maybe one concert every two years. So like, I think I had seen Fiona Apple two years before, and then I saw this, and those were like the two shows that I saw in a half decade. Whereas in my early 20s, I went to about a show a week. So the show that I saw was the Fleet Foxes in Santa Barbara. Now, I got my doctorate at the University of California, Santa Barbara, go Gauchos, and I saw that they were playing, and it was a very exciting moment, you know, like this band. Uh, my, my then wife had played the song White Winter Hymnal for me, and I just became, I just fell in love with it. Everything that I loved about the Beach Boys was in this new band. I couldn't believe it. They were new and exciting, and I loved them, and I couldn't wait to go see them. But this is the thing about this concert. It happened to be like two days after they played Coachella, and at this point, like, the buzz on them was everywhere. It was clear they were the next big American rock band to make it, you know? And where they played, and this is not a joke, they played in a food court. Now, UCSB calls this the hub. It's a food court. I literally saw the Fleet, Fleet Foxes playing in front of, I was standing in front of Panda Express and next to Wendy's. <laughs> it was like the most bizarre thing. Now the band that opened for them, Blitz and Trapper, who also released an album this week, which I may get to, my God, this has been a good week for music. Like while they were opening up, I was just standing there, you know, in front of, in front of Panda Express watching them and they're quite a good band too. And I kind of look over and I, and I see this dude, it's like, it's kind of, he seemed kind of small to me. I don't know if he really was, maybe it was just he was far away. And he had this like kind of scraggly red beard and a and a like a, a flannel and like these jeans are all ripped up and he looks sort of like a parody of what I think someone from Seattle looks like. And I just kind of looked at him and, and he kind of looked at me and he sort of had this like scared look like I was gonna come over and talk to him for some reason. But of course I wouldn't. I had no idea who this guy was. So I was just like, hi, and he was just like, hi. And we just kind of sat there watching Blitz and Trapper, you know, both kind of nodding our heads right next to each other. Imagine my surprise when 15 minutes after uh, Blitz and Trapper went off the stage and I stopped seeing this guy again, he jumps up and he is the Brian Wilson of Fleet Foxes. He is Robin Pecknold. He performs his concert. I use a lot of hyperbole. I do. I can't help it. I like hyperbole. Um, but this truly was one of the best concerts I've ever seen. The reason why is that when you listen to the Fleet Foxes on record, you can't believe that someone could play it that well. Their instrumentation is so ornate and their harmonies are so on point that it's un, it, it's, it goes beyond imagination to think that they could actually nail that live. And they really did. So there I was in front of the Panda Express where I used to you know, study for my comps with my colleagues in, in the French department. There I am like having a, a, a spiritual experience engaging with this amazing music that was as good, if not better, than it was on their album. So what was it that I loved so much about them? I've mentioned the Beach Boys a couple of times. You know, I've come to realize as I've grown older that the band, like the bands that I love the most are the bands that connected to the Beach Boys in the way that I did. Bands like Phoenix, like Daft Punk, like Fleet Foxes. Bands where the idea of producing and producing with meticulous attention to detail to create music that is dense and clear at the same time. That's what Brian Wilson was able to do with the Beach Boys, and that's what all these artists are able to do. But Fleet Foxes may be a little bit more on the nose than those other two, you know, because there's this, the harmonies are just unbelievable. I mean, this guy, and at the time when I saw them in 2009, he was like 20 years old or something ridiculous. Like the, the, the sheer genius of his singing, of his melody, of his songwriting, 
It was just incredible. Now, unlike the Beach Boys, like they're not pop, right? So they don't get to kind of hide behind that pop, right? Which is nice because I didn't listen to the Beach Boys for like 23 years because I just thought they were the Kokomo band. It was only when my friend Blair put me on to Pet Sounds, I was like, Pet Sounds, that's a stupid name for a band. And after I eventually listened to it, I then fell down the rabbit hole and became a huge Beach Boys fan. Another thing I would say that connects them is their goofy lyrics. The Beach Boys have goofy lyrics, and I would also say the Fleet Foxes kind of do too. Not, there's some beautiful, wouldn't it be nice? There's nothing goofy about that. That's a beautiful song. Most of Fleet Foxes are, songs are great, but sometimes Fleet Foxes gets a little bit too mystical, a little bit too Northwest goofy. But the sad part is, you know, they released a second album, uh, Helplessness Blues, you see the poster of it up there, an amazing album, maybe even better than the first album, just track after track after track of, of just amazingly, ornately produced, geniusly co collected music. They stopped. They just stopped. They just stopped making music. And it turns out that sadly, like Brian Wilson, Robin Pecknold, the person behind Fleet Foxes, had a breakdown, had a mental breakdown. He describes it like this. I'm going to quote him quite a few times in this video. Since the unexpected success of the first Fleet Foxes album over a decade ago, I have spent more time than I'm happy to admit in a state of constant worry and anxiety. Worried about what I should make, how it will be received, worried about the moves of other artists, my place amongst them, worried about my singing, voice, mental health on long tours. So I've read some other interviews with him as well, and it seemed as though he basically had a crisis, like part of what made uh, the Beach Boys so great was that they were, well, Brian Wilson was constantly fighting with Paul McCartney and the Beatles, like Rubber Soul and Pet Sounds, and, like they're always trying to one-up each other. And eventually Brian Wilson lost his mind, not because of this, but this was a factor of it, where musically he just couldn't, he couldn't top himself, he couldn't make something as good as Pet Sounds, he couldn't make something as good as Sgt. Pepper's, I mean he could. Anyways, like he felt that he couldn't and it just stopped him. I think the difference though, and I've read this in other interviews with, with Pecknold, is that he sort of feels like a responsibility for the direction that pop music or that indie pop music went after he showed up. The kind of like inspirational, moving, soft folk rock that invaded American airwaves. Essentially, Mumford & Sons. Now, I don't actually know Mumford & Sons that well, I heard them and I just said, yeah, this, this sucks donkey butt. I just didn't like it. Didn't like it at all. But the thing was, the people who liked Mumford & Sons talked to me the way I talked to them about Fleet Foxes. Listen to these harmonies. Listen to this instrumentation. It just has this great whole feeling and you just feel lifted up. And I didn't get that feeling from them. Maybe someday I'll give them a chance. I don't know. You can put in the comments, are they worth listening to? But the sense that I got was that they felt sort of responsible, or he felt responsible for this kind of crappy music <laughs> that came out after him, and that his place in music had been usurped by people who were more successful at making it popular. This made me think of a, a funny analogy. What if Radiohead called it quits after Coldplay hit? You know? I mean, Coldplay and Radiohead, it's a very similar thing. Like, I just don't like Coldplay. I used to make fun of them. I don't make fun of them anymore. I respect them enough, you know? But like, they are kind of a knockoff, like pop version of Radiohead. And the way people feel about Coldplay is the way I feel about Radiohead. But like, they're just not it. Like whatever that it is, they're not it. I don't know if it's cool. I don't know if it's soulful. I don't care to put a word on it. <laughs> just not it. So what happened, you know, what would have happened if, if Radiohead, like Fleet Foxes, just said, you know, I have become death, destroyer of worlds. I brought Coldplay, I brought Mumford and Sons. I need to disappear. Are artists responsible for the banality, popularity, and ubiquity of those that follow them, of their imitators? I say no. But this is the great and happy difference. Now, I'm going to title this something provocative on purpose. My Strokes video was called The Strokes Are Better Than The Stones 20 Years In, because I was trying to be provocative, right? <clears throat> but I also meant it, that like the Rolling Stones were great for a good 10, 15 years, and then they haven't been good since. So 20 years in. The Strokes, who made a great album this year, are better. And I'm gonna say that the, the Fleet Foxes are better 15 years in than the Beach Boys were, or 14 years, who cares however many years it's been. But like, the Beach Boys, obviously, way more of an impact on culture, on society, and without them, the Fleet Foxes would be nothing. But sort of, at this equivalent time, 
You know, 1975 would be the equivalent of the start of the Beach Boys uh, until 1975. It's the same amount of distance from the start of Fleet Foxes until now. By 75, they just released Holland, which is an okay album. Like, they were still good and fine, but they'd kind of lost it. And ultimately, the reason they lost it is what's fortunate for us and unfortunate for the world at the same time. That Brian Wilson's break wasn't about the Beatles. It wasn't some superficial thing. It was a real psychotic break. Like he has a real medical issue, probably even hereditary. Like you can't, like you can't work your way out of it. You can't think your way out of it. Like he's a sick person. So we are blessed with the fact that Robin Pecknold could. He could figure out how to get out of this feeling, out of this, the weight of perfection, like the weight of genius. He was able to get his way out of it. So he came back in 2017, one year before I started this show. Do you, do you think I listened to that album? I did. I listened to it once. I said, nope, that's my bad. I, that's probably a good album. So probably at some point I'm going to review that album too, because I never gave it a shot. I listened to it one time, and this was back before I started this channel, before I tried to you know, re, be reborn in music, and I didn't listen to it. And so. I'm just giving this album, and I'm treating this album as though it is the first thing, and it is the first thing I've heard since Helplessness Blues. Where is he? Why is this album so good? First of all, this gets my highest possible recommendation. There is no reason not to buy this album immediately. It is a masterpiece through and through. I've only listened to it for two days, but it's the kind of listening where you know this is it. <laughs> this is just such a great, rich experience. Now it has a lot of like very wordy uh, art. Sorry, this I thought it, I thought it'd be good to wear this like weird kind of like overcoat thingy, but I am way too warm. Whew. But now I'm way too blue. Oh, doesn't matter. And a lot of kind of like uh, wordy artist statements uh, that you can read from Pecknold, like on Apple Music and on Bandcamp. And it's interesting this album in particular because if if we go by the the metric of you know are these. Are the Fleet Foxes really the new Beach Boys? Which I, I would say they are. I, I really do, I, I really think they are. Um, then like, this album is interesting because the Fleet Foxes aren't really on it. And even in the artist statement, Pecknold talks about how there's two different Fleet Foxes. There's the studio Fleet Foxes and there's the touring Fleet Foxes, you know? And that, you know, that's the story of Pet Sounds, right? <laughs> like the, the Beach Boys went out and toured and they came back home and Brian Wilson's like, I made a, I made a, I made a good one, <laughs> you know, like basically the entire thing. Hey, Toby, Toby, I'm talking about fleet foxes. Please stop barking. Toby, Toby, Toby. Okay. If you've never watched my channel before, I am constantly fighting with Toby. So, um, you know, if there are these two different versions of the Beach Boys, which there were, there was the Mike Love going out and touring, and then there's the Brian Wilson alone in the studio, right? Just trying to work things out here. This album very much feels like this is Robin Pecknell doing it, except he really can do it all with a little bit of help from people here and there. And what's interesting is in his description of this album, he's saying that basically he felt compelled to release this album, like it was a moral imperative. He says, and this is a quote from him again, by February 2020, I was consumed with worry and anxiety over this album and how I would finish it. But since March, with the pandemic spiraling out of control, living in a failed state, watching and participating in a rash of protests, most of my anxiety around the album disappeared. Uh, in its place came a gratitude. So what's interesting here is that his reaction to, you know, because there's so many people like, 2020 sucks. If 2020 were a burrito, it'd be frozen on the inside and burn your mouth on the outside. I just came up with that right now. If 2020 were a plant, it'd be dead. Whatever, all these like stupid memes and everyone complaining about how much 2020 sucks. Instead of seeing that, this actually helped to put everything in perspective for him. To say, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do with my music. I don't know what I'm going to do with my album. I've got the weight of genius, the weight of perfection, and even worse, the weight of perfectionism. The weight of perfectionism on my head, but I just got to put it out. And he says, this gave me a different perspective on how important or not this music was in the grand scheme of things. Music is both the most inessential and the most essential thing. This is a hell of an artist statement. <laughs> 
right? So saying, this music might do nothing, or it might provide solace, it might provide comfort, it might provide joy, and it might provide genuine transcendence, as this album does. This is a transcendent album, right? Like you listen to it and you actually, at least I did, I transcended my physical self in some way. I'm not saying like I see my aura or anything like that. I'm just saying like that feeling that very, very, it's not very often I feel that way, right? So it's, he's able to do it. And so he just released this album and just made it his. And I've read a lot of comments, you know, where are the rest of the members? Apparently one of the members is named Sky. So it sucks that Sky's not on here, but it's okay. You know, I'm sure they're going to come back and we just get to have this beautiful album where we get to see what does he do when he's alone in the studio? What does he produce? And the inspiration above, like all this put together gives a context for what this album is about. It's really about two things that are very, that go together. It's about like inspiration from other musicians. So, you know, like, like the importance of music, but then it's also about the vision of himself that he has, but it's himself in nature. Like those are the two themes, other artists and himself in nature. And you kind of put those together and you have this album where basically he's sort of looking back and looking forward at the same time. And there's lots of playing with time, with seasons, with talking about the future, with talking about the past. Um, I'm gonna kind of go now and break down the album sort of by its components. Lyrically, he's still kind of in his weirdly I think goofily pretentious mode, like using words that like I've never heard of and don't know the definition of. Um, in some ways he feels almost like he's writing haiku because you know in haiku you always have to make some reference to nature. It's not just about the syllables. Every song feels like it has to have some reference to nature. Uh, it's drenched in nature, this album. There's like a song about sailing. There's a song about hiking. There's a song about going to L.L. Bean. <laughs> there isn't really, but there is something very kind of like Northwestern-y like L.L. Bean outlet shopping about this album, which I, I'm i putting it down when I say that. I know I'm being snarky, but it is something that has kept me at a distance from this album because it feels just very sort of like privileged, uh, upper middle class, you know, white culture of like traveling and outdoorsmanship. But screw that, right? I mean, would it be more interesting if he was talking about drugs or about sex and all the women he's with? No, I mean, you have to sing about something. You know, Brian Wilson couldn't even write a lyric to save his life, so he had to get, you know, Van Dyke Parks or someone else to write his lyrics for him. At least what he's saying is well said, interesting, and it comes from him. So I think, much like the Beach Boys, you can put the lyrics on a secondary scale. They are a vehicle for his voice, but they are not the point of the music. And once you do that, you can be free to be like, okay, I don't care if this song is called Apoplexia or whatever, the, the fourth solstice of the third moon, just get to the beautiful stuff, right? Um, he, in his own description of it, he said he's trying to celebrate life in a time of death and trying to find something to hold on to that exists outside of time, something that feels stable. And that thing that feels stable is references to other artists and to himself. It's funny because in, in the band camp description, he gives this long list of artists that I don't know very well that influenced him. The only one that I did know particularly well was Sam Cooke, so I put him there. I do think Sam Cooke works well in general as another counterpoint to the Fleet Foxes, so I'm not only talking about the Beach Boys, because there's a quality to Sam Cooke's voice, which does that thing, <laughs> that transcendent thing, which, oh, oh, I mean, I can't do it, obviously, or else I'd be a singer, not a French professor pretending to be a music uh, reviewer. There's just uh, in, in ineffable quality to Sam Cooke's voice that at times Robin Pecknold is able to hit. The weird thing about Sam Cooke is that he could hit it every time. Every time Sam Cooke opened up his mouth to sing, he hit that crazy ineffable thing where, where you feel like you're, like you're eating like some ice cream that you've never tasted before and you don't necessarily like it on the first bite, but on the second bite you realize it's the best ice cream you've ever had. Like every time Sam Cooke sings, that's what it sounds like. And at times, Robin Pecknold can hit that. I'm going really out here with these metaphors. I don't write, I don't write scripts, right? I write down notes. So sometimes metaphors are good, sometimes they're not. Uh, music, again, if I want to go back to this description of what makes Fleet Foxes and the Beach Boys similar, what makes it so great, it's the density and the clarity. So the production is so dense, so ornate. The term that's often used in referring to them as Baroque. But I'm both an art history professor and, I mean, I'm an art history student, 
and a French professor who focused on 17th century French literature. So the word Baroque is just Baroque. It's just, it's everywhere. Now it just means shorthand for complicated. So I'm not gonna apply it to actual music theory or art theory right now. I'll just say complicated, ornate. I'm just gonna stick with ornate. Um, the music sounds a lot more 70s than I remember it, a little bit more glossy, a little bit more like uh, laid back, almost sounds a little bit more West Coasty than like Northwesty at times, um, but it's just so unbelievably well produced. And as far as I can tell, uh, Beatrice Artola, she's the person who helped him produce it, uh, record it, probably deserves this, like she probably deserves to be like in the album title, like Fleet Foxes with Beatrice Artola, because I can't imagine how difficult this is. And I'm gonna get into the density, but I cannot imagine how difficult this was to edit and put together with the amount of layers and the amount of songs and just to have one person doing it. And then you're sitting there, like I would love, absolutely love, like a 20 hour documentary. Hell, I'll take a half hour documentary just with their working process. Cause it was recorded in like France and New York and California, just all over the place. Like how, how was this done? How does this, how is this masterpiece put together with one person doing 90% of it and the other person having to edit it? How do they not go crazy? Anyways, uh, that's how I describe the music. There's also a real structure to this album. Um, and the, the structure I would say is that it, it, like, it feels like a full album conceived of as an album. So there's upbeat songs next to slow songs. You can tell there's an intention, there's an intention, intentionality to the way it's put together. Um, like there's like, my favorite example is there's this quiet, haunting, amazing, just shut up, I can't stop talking about it song for a week or two that leads right into like basically a rock song, Maestranza, right? Like they're able to just really have this nice flow to the album. And if you stay tuned to the end, which I hope you will, I'm going to put forth a theory I don't entirely believe in, that this is actually a ring theory album that's based on a spiral and not a linear progression. What do I mean by that? Stay tuned to the end. It's kind of stupid, but it could be right. Usually with a Fleet Foxes album, there's one track that like just just stays in my head and it's just a gift. For the first album is White, Whiter, White Winter Hymnal. I mean, it's their biggest hit probably, but I don't care. I mean, I just heard that. And when I heard that, it, I felt like my life changed. Uh, on their second album, it, it's Battery Kinsey because like it has this doom, 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 doom. It has this whole kind of rhythmic thing. And, and like, I just had so much fun trying to like get all the thumps right because it's just a bass drum. Just doom, 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 doom. Like I couldn't quite get it right and the construction was so out of, like out of place. So my question for myself is, Sky, what is your one track? Like what is the track that just sails above the rest? I don't have one. I thought it was one and then it was a different one. I thought it was another one, I thought it was another one. I think I wanna be able to make the case that with the exception of about three songs, every track on this album is as good as every other track and is absolutely amazing. So let's start, let's start. Track by track, my Pink Citroen. Waiting in, the high, in waist high water. Water is all throughout in this album thematically. Starts talking off about summer and it's someone else singing. And this is a really interesting idea because for this album, which is basically just a dude alone in a studio with someone in a control room, all of a sudden we have Uwade Akere singing here. And it's an interesting idea. And I think it's intentional. I think it's trying to sort of throw us off and take us out of the sort of, like, I think we're very tempted, and I am totally guilty of this, to try to find the one man genius theory and the alone person who's doing everything. And this review already is filled with that kind of thinking. But I think having someone else's voice right off the bat makes you go outside and not just think of Robin Pecknold, the misunderstood genius guy, right? And so, I mean, just the, the production here, it's just like, there's some guitar with just hints of horns. The way horns are used is just brilliant on this album because they're very rarely way up front. They're always just in the back, adding to that texture, that density. And then Pecknold is just, just like backup singer here, which leads seamlessly into the track Sunblind, which is just, a, it's, it's almost like a shout out song. Like a lot of hip, uh, particularly Biz Marquee, one of my favorites. But uh, in the old school of hip hop, people just do shout out tracks at the end where they just say everybody, like they'd say the names of all their friends. This is just all these singers who have passed. And it gives you this idea, again, the central theme of the album of, you know, music is important and unimportant at the same time. Um, but it's just so like, 
this is a great album that you can listen to in every way. You can definitely listen to it like through the speakers on your phone while walking from room to room. It's fine. It, it holds up. It's enough of a, like there's enough power to the music to go through. You can put it on your hi-fi and listen to it while you're, you know, while you're making a tofu bowl for your kids like I did yesterday. You know, it's fine. By the way, the key to tofu, cornstarch. You just gotta dry that stuff out. But if you listen to this album with headphones, like I did last night, I said, okay, you know what? I'm not gonna watch a movie. I'm not gonna watch Netflix. I'm just gonna sit down, put this thing in my headphones and listen to it. It takes on a whole nother, whole nother dimension because you hear all the texture. When the drums come in, it's just so sweet. And it's, it's just this amazing, amazingly rich experience that, that is like watching a movie. You know, it's like, it's like watching a, a Kubrick movie or something, right? Where you're like, like, oh, I didn't notice that detail that time. And obviously, obviously the plant is on that table for a reason, but what is the reason? That's how it feels here. There's, um, particularly with headphones, like the way the bass work comes in on the third verse. I know this is stupid, stupid detail, okay? This is why I do my channel, okay? because I have to talk about this. I don't care to give it a nine out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. I don't care. I don't care what you, th like, I don't care about giving a grade. I care about having someone to talk to about the bass work on the third verse, which just comes up a little bit louder and makes it so powerful, so well produced. Ah, and the lyrics too, it's interesting because he seems, he's talking about artists who he thinks are better than him. Like, so he's kind of freeing himself from this genius and from this perfectionism by saying, hey, these other people, uh, I think what he says is he's overmatched. So he's kind of free through this submission. And then he makes a reference to Plato's cave, but I'm not gonna get into that. It's already 27 minutes and I'm through the second song. Uh, the next track, Can I Believe You? I didn't like the first two times I listened to it. And then this morning I listened to it, uh, driving to the farmer's market. That's, that's the most pretentious sentence I've ever said. I can't help it. I go to the farmer's market every Sunday. <sighs> Anyways, while driving to the farmer's market, uh, and I was just driving in the car and just totally jamming out to it, so happy. What's cool here is that sometimes the lyrics are lost in the texture, and I think that's not even a problem, but sometimes they are. But here, like for the most part, it's just his one voice coming through. Um, the lyrics seem kind of throwaway, like, can I believe you, can I trust you? Um, but it has like these cool kind of real 1970s kind of soft rock LA chord changes, but all kind of matched with an interesting idiosyncratic rhythm. Uh, just a great rock track. And then there's a really cool bridge where it gets kind of sparse before one more chorus comes in. Then we have the track Yara, which is probably my least favorite track on the album, but it's still a great, al it's still a great track. Um, it's an invocation of a Chilean folk hero, and the chair of my department is from Chile, so I sent her an email last night. Hopefully, hopefully she'll have something to say about this, because I'd never heard of this person. Um, but what's interesting is the way that he refers to it is that it's not really about this singer, it's about what this singer can do. So again, going back to this theme, right, these two themes, Robin Pecknold and nature, and then music is important and unimportant. So just the idea of what can this kind of singer, or singer truly martyred for freedom, what can they do? Uh, it's just, even though this is my least favorite track, even though this is the only track which feels to me like it could be potentially considered a filler, it's so rich, it's so well sung, that, it, that it's, it's great. And I'm totally happy that it's there. Nice kind of incidental bird sounds in the back, kind of weird kind of keyboard bloops too. Seriously, like you just, kind of like this artwork back here from Helplessness Blues with all these, you know, you can't see from a distance. It doesn't look very impressive. When you look up, there's all these little details and you get kind of lost. You try and find the story. That's what the production's like. I also hear a little bit of Jackson Brown style singing here. I've never heard him mention Jackson Brown. I don't know. That might be controversial. Does anyone else hear that? Just me? Next track is called Featherweight. Uh, nice, at, you know, guitar layering here. And then I, I just, okay, I just, I, I have a detail for you. I mean, I have, I have an example of the super density of this album and the clarity and why it's so beautiful, okay? This is it. A beautifully written chorus, okay? May the last long year be forgotten, all the war left within it. I couldn't, though I'm beginning to, and we've only made it together, feel some change in the weather. I couldn't, though I'm beginning to. And then the second that he says two, 
there's a weird piano part that sounds like it's played by someone who doesn't know how to play piano. It's kind of tinkering, almost random, but actually listening, it's not, it's in key. And then like three guitars come in, maybe three, maybe two, maybe four, maybe five come in, all kind of playing the same thing. Before, like this weird little like noodling guitar solo comes in, this kind of weird Spanish guitar solo thing comes in, right before the second verse comes in, and though it's all so uncertain, cold, all the rafters cracked, all the copper sold, there's a ration back in a manifold if you need it or forgot. All that that I was talking about with the pianos and the guitar and all of that happened in 13 seconds. And when I listened while making a tofu bowl, I didn't hear it. But when I was listening to the headphones, I heard it. And then today, when driving back from the farmer's market, I heard it even though I wasn't paying attention to it. And that's the beauty of this kind of production. It's the same thing that happens to the Beach Boys. Once you start hearing it, you can't unhear it. Even if you're passively listening, like I will always hear that little tiny piano bit. That's what I mean by amazingly effective, dense production. Just super duper dense. I'm not gonna play it for you. I'm not gonna play it for you because I only wanna play 13 seconds of this album because I don't wanna get copyright strikes. But if you want to do that experiment, find the song Featherweight from one minute and 31 seconds to one minute and 44 seconds. That's, that's all it took. Now the great thing is, like a good screenwriter, that was foreshadowing, that little piano, because that comes back after the second chorus and it comes as like a whole solo in that weird style. It almost sounds like a player piano, like just totally disjointed and weird. And it's this weird production that fits within the warmth of the rest of the song. <sighs> it's great. I really want, does the album that I skipped this good, by the way, if you're a Fleet Foxes fan, if you're a Foxy Boxy, I don't know what you call yourself if you're a, a Fleet Foxes fan, it, was it as good as, as this album? And I just missed it because I'm a dummy. That's quite possible. Uh, the album ends with the track, One Warm Day is All I Need, and that's this theme of passing time, which happens over and over again. And then we have A Long Way Past the Past. And I think this might be the winner. This might be the track that stays with me because it's unlike every other Fleet Foxes song I've heard, at least. It's just this very driving song. You know, there's no like rhythmic play here. There's no like, it doesn't actually feel particularly Baroque or ornate. It's just layer upon layer upon layer, almost droning. And these kind of interesting lyrics about being stuck in the past and these horns come in and leave and maybe there's mandolin in the background or maybe a harmonium, I can't quite tell. And then there's like this little interlude which actually sounds like it's trying to sound like an old Fleet Foxes song. Is that intentional? Is this like a weird callback because the song is about the weird nostalgia that we all feel right now? Because 2020 is the worst, okay? If 2020 were a comedy magazine, it would be cracked. I mean, right? Like, I, I, is this just a way of like expressing this lame feeling that we all have that things were so much better in the past? I don't know. Is this an intentional callback to old style Fleet Foxes song? Maybe. But then the track ends with that's that or a long way from the past, I'll be better in a year or two. And it goes right after this like, this car, the, the guitar gets slightly like detuned and then he sings these last words and it has this power. And again, whenever the harmonies go away, whenever like 10 pecknolds turn into one pecknold, uh, it just has a certain strength to it. So I'm gonna play you just some of this song to give you a sense of this different style. If you've heard the Fleet Foxes in the past, maybe you haven't heard like this kind of style. This, it's almost like if Jeff Lynne could produce something that didn't suck and wasn't the worst thing in the world and I hate Jeff Lynne and Jeff Lynne should rot in hell. Like, it's, it's like that in a way. I have strong feelings about Jeff Lynne. But it has that same kind of like glossy feeling without being the worst music ever made. You hear that kind of drone in there? And you can't hear it through this speaker, through this speaker, through that speaker, but the horns are coming in in the back. And I think maybe this is the most Sam Cooke song, actually, now that I think about it. The way it's sung and the way the horns come in. It has that, that bite of ice cream that you didn't expect. 
just unbelievable. And, and, and I sort of thought, okay, this has got to be the song. And then last night, with my headphones on, I listened to the song for a week or two. <sighs> okay, so I don't know how I'm even going to start to describe this song. The drums are just, I believe, tapping on wood or tapping on guitar. And it's just harmony everywhere. The full vocal beauty. This is like the opening track to Smile, if you've heard it, you know, the, the, uh, a teenage hymn to God. It's like the best Beach Boys harmony songs, you know, like, like where it's just them singing and you just feel like lifted up. That's what this is like. Very simple songs in the background, just very simple piano in the background. Sometimes the piano actually matches his voice. Um, and like, you know, I, I listened to it and I cried. And I didn't cry because I was sad. And I didn't cry like, it's so beautiful. Like, I just couldn't stop. Like, some music does that to me. And, and that's what I mean by transcendent. It, it's like my physical self couldn't handle the emotional impact of the music. And I'm looking at my notes here, and it's pretty funny, because this is sort of the life of a, of a music critic or a literary critic or whatever it is, right? Because even though my job is not to study music, my job is kind of to study books, and it's a similar idea. You, like, try to find this transcendent thing, this, like, totally meaningful, deep truth, and then break it apart and, like, study it from every single angle and kind of destroy the beautiful thing, you know? Like, you want to take the genius and pet it and call it George and just squeeze it until its neck breaks, you know? So I'm looking at my notes here. And, and look, at, look at what I actually wrote. Actually cried. Bird sounds. A bit unnecessary. <laughs> so there you go. I don't know if I was trying to protect myself because I was feeling vulnerable from listening to this song. I actually cried. Bird sounds are unnecessary. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, the pastoral, like the lyrics are very pastoral and I think that's very intentional. I think I read in, in one of his interviews the song is about going on a hiking trip. <laughs> L.O. Bean music. Still, you know, talking about some lost coast, some bright days, no face on your young head, piece of wheat in your teeth, carrying water, pears and bread. I just don't know how one person can do this. I just don't. I, I don't. Like it, it's, this feeling is such an exciting feeling to have as a music fan. And it's just great. And my, my wife was upstairs and I texted her. I'm like, you got to listen to the song on headphones. And she's like, Do I, does it have to be on headphones? And I said, yes. And then it turns out she listened to it three times in a row, right? Just because wh what can you do? What, what can you do once you know that this song exists and people can make music this beautiful? Your life is better and worse at the same time. Because like, I'm never going to be able to do that. Uh, I felt a similar way after getting into the new Tame Impala album. I'm like, how does someone make a drum line work so well while playing by themselves? Uh, the next track, Maestranza, weird kind of funky song with like a syncopated piano. It's almost like disco, and it's like a kind of a, a COVID song. So in that way, it reminds me a little bit of the, the Chromeo uh, album that came out, uh, Rurona's Got Me Stressed. Uh, the whole song seems to be about Corona. Sunday end, ache for the sight of friends, though I've been safe in the thought. The, the line we walk is the same one. I like that, that we're all going through the same thing. There's a weird kind of equalizer about the fear of COVID except all of the rat lickers and no mask wearers, throw that all off. Um, the bridge is cool because he kind of sings along with the thumped drum, drum line. He even changes keys at the end, but it's kind of okay and falls apart at the end. Young Man's Game, speaking of Tame Impala, it reminds me, this album reminds me a lot of the slow rush in the way that it feels like it's somebody who's old, but like still a lot younger than me, talking about getting old. And I, I remember being in my early 30s and being like, I'm not young anymore. Um, so it reminds me a little bit of, you know, not as cool as you used to be, uh, but it's just upbeat, awesome, crazy harmonies. He calls himself a rolling antique his whole life. And I think that's true. Uh, it's kind of smart to, to be kind of old timey, even when you're young, because then when you get old, you don't seem old. Like my first car was a minivan because I knew when I was going to be older, I'd have a family and have a minivan. So when I think of a minivan, I think I'm young. I'm, I'm a young guy. Okay. Um, great kind of like fuzzy guitar, super hardworking drummer on this. There's a lot of great drumming. He doesn't do the drumming on it. Um, and then at the end, there's like this weird kids chorus. I don't know what the deal is with that. Um, but I love the idea that he's singing, You Are My Last Hope. And that's really, I think, when you know you're old. You know you're old when you know that you are not the hope. Right? <laughs> like, with the political situation lately, things have been pretty rough. And what I just say to my kids all the time is like, you got to study. I mean, you're the hope. <laughs> You know, I mean, I might be able to affect some change, but you're the hope. You, you guys are the hope. Because 
in some ways, changing the world is, is a young man's game or a young woman's game, obviously. Uh, it's not my season, more of the obsession with seasons. Uh, it's sort of like a, a voice, just one voice again, kind of clarity there, summer light, winter long. It turns out this is all about boats and sailing. Um, and uh, that just reminds me of Sloop John B from, <laughs> from Pet Sounds. Just, I, maybe he just feels like he has permission to sing songs about boating. Uh, the next track, Quiet Air, Giola, may be, this may be the track, this may be the one that I say is the best, because it has this crazy muted sound. Like, it feels like they recorded everything and then put a blanket on top of it. <laughs> like, these drums are muted, the guitar is muted, everything's muted with this voice just going everywhere. And some, again, you just, like, you just listen to the headphones and you hear these guitars show up and this, like, fuzzy guitar showing up. Um, it's a little bit clumsy. I feel like there's too many words for the verses. Um, but the second part gets a little more interesting with more voices. Going to Sun Road uh, apparently is a reference to the place that was the scene from the opening of The Shining, speaking of Kubrick. You know that crazy road? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> right? So uh, that's kind of fun to imagine being there and not being terrified. <laughs> um, and it's this is cool because it's so 70s feeling, but it has some harpsichord and muted bass. And again, this feels very consciously like a Beach Boys reference in a way because they use bass and harpsichord so well. But also, it's kind of avant-garde at points. Like, it feels almost, reminds me a little bit of Philip Glass, we'll be coming back to him later. Just kind of like very unexpected rhythms and then just amazing horns all the way throughout. Um, but it's rhythmically very cohesive. And then we have the track Thymia, T-H-Y-M-I-A, which is another song about a love affair with music. In this way, it reminds me also of the Bill Callahan album that I reviewed last month, um, because it's sort of like just about the importance of making music and you know, like this thing. But what's funny is, in his own quote about this song, he says, "Time yeah means boisterous spirit or something. So even the dude himself doesn't know what all of his weird song title names are, further evidence that his lyrics are very secondary. Then we get to the track, which is sort of the closing track, Cradling Mother, Cradling Woman. Now, when I first heard this, the Philip Glass thing is what really came to me. Just like Philip Glass has a lot of things with polyrhythms going on, and there's a lot of polyrhythms going on here with the keyboard or the kind of harpsichord, you think that. But then I realized <laughs> this is what's just amazing, okay? So it turns out, and I was afraid because I knew I was gonna be talking a lot about about the, pet, about the Beach Boys, because I think you have to when you talk about the Fleet Foxes, but I hadn't read anything in any of the writing about it. It was all about these other artists who I didn't have any opinions about, right? Besides Sam Cooke, okay? I'm not as cool as Robin Pecknold, obviously. But then this track has a sample from the box set of Pet Sounds from an outtake of Don't Cry, Put Your Head on My Shoulder, of Brian Wilson going, one, two, three, four. Now, I'm gonna talk about this for a while, so just have fun, <laughs> or skip it, I don't care. Subscribe before you skip. Skip and then subscribe. Don't skip, subscribe. The, the idea of him taking Brian Wilson's voice <laughs> and not taking him singing, take him go one, two, three, four, is so perfect for this album. It expresses every, that one act is sort of the thesis statement of the entire album because it's him by, basically by himself having to do all these crazy overdubs, having to go to that space where the weight of perfectionism and the weight of genius is on his head. But like taking Brian Wilson's inspiration and knowing that him going on, two, three, four, that that led to don't cry, put your head on my shoulder. Don't talk. Don't talk, put your head on my shoulder, yes. That's what a big Beach Boys fan I am. I don't know the name of the songs. Like, you can put in the comments that I'm an idiot. That's great. Oh, uh, you know, like, the, the idea that, like, this is what he took. And it's very important, too, because when I think about the Beach Boys, like, there's a certain kind of Beach Boys fan, right? If you're not in it for the Kokomo, you're also probably not in it for Surfing USA. M like, most people, like me or, you know, music fans get into it through through pet sounds and like the first two albums that you should get as a new beach boys fan one you should get pet sounds number two 
you should get the box set of Pet Sound that breaks it all down and gives you the acapella version and gives you the instrumental version and gives you all the outtakes and gives you this book, which you can read from cover to cover that explains how the whole thing was made. Please make one of these for this album, uh, Mr. Robin Pecknold and uh, Miss Artola, because I think it would be out there, you know? Like, this, this is what really makes the Beach Boys so important. It's not just that their music was popular, it's that this myth, this true myth of Brian Wilson there going one, two, three, four, that that's how it was all done. And that showed Robin Pecknell that he could make it and then he's sharing it with us. And there's just this beautiful quote with him where he thanks Brian Wilson. He says, thank you so much for letting us sample the small snippet of your uh, voice. The snippets come from a clip of you recording layer after layer of vocal overdubs onto Don't Talk, Put Your Head on My Shoulder, or Don't Cry, <laughs> the alternate version, from the Pet Sounds box set. As a teenager, I would listen to this clip for hours on end, amazed at what you were building with just your voice. This clip, more than any other piece of music, completely changed and guided my life. It is a tremendous honor that these small echoes of it appear on a song that is itself such an odyssey of overdubs and influenced by your work. Thank you. Right? Isn't that beautiful? Doesn't that make you happy? That makes me happy. That he was able to do it and to, and to just make such a beautiful piece of art that's so clearly borrowing from someone else, but then also building on top of it. This great line of continuity of like artists all trying to like go after the same thing and, and reaching it in different ways at different times under different circumstances. <sighs> this song itself seems to be sort of about being middle-aged, about like, you know, looking kind of rough, but I'm okay. My shirts are torn, but I'm cool. Uh, but it's just a masterpiece of overdubbing. Like, what are you doing right now? Like, what, what are you doing for the rest of the day that is not listening to this? You really need to listen to this. Uh, then finally, it ends with the track Shore, which is a duet from the same person from the beginning, except this time, Pecknold's voice is up front and her voice is in the back. And this is what leads me to what I promised in the beginning, the ring theory. So ring theory is a way of looking at artistic works, which goes, it's circular as opposed to linear, okay? So that like the beginning is supposed to be matched by the end. And then the second thing is supposed to be matched by the second to last thing until you have this sort of like harmonic harmonic vision of a work. Popular, uh, in an interesting way, someone did this for the Star Wars movies made by George Lucas and it works quite well. It doesn't, as far as I can tell this, I'm just fleshing this theory out right now, so I don't know. But definitely the first two tracks and the last two tracks match this perfectly. Waiting in High Water is a song with this female singer and she's taking the lead, and it's all about water and the importance of water, and then Shore is the last track on the album with the same singer, except now Pecknold is up front, and it's about the safety of the shore and yourself in nature. So these are the two theme. this is the one main theme of the album, Robin Pecknold and his relationship to nature, in particular to water and the safety of the shore while almost drowning. Apparently that happened to him when he was younger. And then, we move in one song, move in one song. Sunblind is entirely dedicated to all these artists who he loves, who's given him the inspiration and proof that music matters and doesn't matter at the same time. And then Cradling Mother, Cradling Woman, which is an extended dedication to Brian Wilson's genius and someone who taught him how to make music and how to be a great genius. So we have this beautiful echo. Unfortunately, I can't figure out how the rest of it goes. I don't know if it keeps going. Uh, can I believe you to Thymia for a week or two to going to Sun Road, Featherweight to Quiet Air, Long Way Past the Past to It's Not My Season. Actually, those match pretty well. For a week or two, Young Man's Game, and then Maestrana right in the middle. I don't know if it all works. If you're a Fleet Foxes Reddit person, look, look, look into it. it. There could be something there. Clearly this album was created with purpose, with vision. It wouldn't surprise me. Certainly that's an intentional beginning and ending the one and the two, and the, the 14 and the 15 matching. So there you go. Highest possible recommendation. I think this is my longest video ever. <sighs> I have so much to say, and I just want to stop talking and listen to the album again. <sighs> All right, well, until next time. For Toby, who's a very good boy, thank you for stopping barking, and Sam Cooke, and for Cupid. There's the camera. <laughs>